Hi everyone and welcome to Real Life Talks. I'm your host Yvonne Heath, author of the book Love Your Life to Death and founder of the I Just Showed Up movement. So I am here for part two of a two-part conversation with Eva Olson. Um, welcome Eva because I needed to continue our conversation. There's just, you have a, a life of experience being 94 years young. <laughs> We could not talk about it all in the first show, so I'm so pleased that we're here to continue our conversation. Thank you for having me. It's yes, good to be here. It is good. I'm, I'm so honored that you're here. So in the last show, we talked a little bit about um, your life, your upbringing in Hungary mm. with a wonderful mother and your father, wonderful in many ways, but a fundamentalist. Yeah, he was a scholar. Yes, I wrote brilliant three man. books, but he wrote 18. Wow, he wrote 18 books. Incredible, but Biblically strict. Biblically related. Yes, all about the Bible, and you and your brother had different ideas, so that caused a lot of conflict. Yes, right. but what we're going to talk a little bit more today about is how your life changed May 15th, 1944 what happened because you are a survivor, a thriver, you lived through the Holocaust, <laughs> which is not everyone knows the Holocaust was a mass genocide by the German Nazis. And a denial you were there. denial of human existence, my dear. A denial of human existence. Yes. And you were stripped, people were stripped of dignity and rights and many were murdered, many were treated as slaves. And so this is a hard conversation, um, but it happened and the truth needs to be shared. And I would love for you to share your experience while you were at Auschwitz, the concentration camp. Well, we, my sister and I ended up in a, on a top bunk. Well, actually, when we were separated from the family, and they took us to the Hungarian women's camp. Okay. And my sister and I, eight of us on the top bunk. Eight. Eight. Four and four, day and night. You were sitting in the nighttime with your knees to your chest because there wasn't enough room to stretch your legs out. My goodness. The ones underneath us couldn't sit up because there wasn't enough headroom. Those were the conditions. Four thirty in the morning, roll call. Everybody had to go out two hours standing for no parent reason. It could be raining just like it is now. And then we got in back into the barrack and line up for a daily ration, one piece of bread, 70% sawdust. Oh, Soup was like dirty water made out of the peeling of the potatoes that were not washed. And if you were toward the end of the line, there were no more peeling, just that dirty water. That's what you were given every day? That was given every day. Now, what happened to us, we didn't know why. We knew there was another part of the camp where people went to work, okay? We went part of that. Then I found out the reason for that was one day they told us to go outside. They said we're about to be tattooed. Oh, okay. Before they started with that procedure, half a dozen German civilians arrived. You know, those big black high hats and boots and mm. um, we never got the number. Mm. They isolated 2,000 and shipped us to Germany as slave laborers. The first slave labor camp in a city, and I can mention the city because that area is still wired out. Dusseldorf. Okay. Remember a couple of years ago, a pilot took a plane down, he was mm -hmm. They dumped us in a field, sleeping on the ground. Mm. There were some tents, 
but it didn't have help if it rained. 4.30 in the morning, everybody was counted 2,000 in case somebody escaped. Mm -hmm. Marched down to the river, freight ships coming in with bricks, bundles of bricks that were tied together with a metal band. And we had to pile them up along the banks. A few weeks later, another miracle. Speaking of miracles, my miracle when <clears throat> a prisoner told me in Auschwitz to give my niece, I held her hand, mm -hmm. to an older woman. And I didn't know why, but eventually I let go of Judy's hand. She was three and a half. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. Because if you were with a child... You were sent to the left to die. Which So you went left to die, right... To work. Okay. Here is another mini selection by four or five civilians, and the rest were the army there. And he went over the fence, the other side. This guy sends me back. In other words, I wasn't going to leave him, my sister. And I understood German, and she said, nine, nine, that is the best of all. I mean, what it means, that's the best quality. Okay. I was 19, 19 and a half healthy. Mm -hmm. So I went, took us to the capital of the Rhine, Essen, where we worked for the crop manufacturer. They manufactured ammunition. Yeah. And that was a miracle because we, we had a soft camp, barracks, bunks, a kitchen and water. Mm -hmm. That didn't last very long. Mm -hmm. The Allies were bombing very heavily. My goodness. I had a call two years ago this December from a man saying, Hi, I am Mike. I said, OK. <laughs> I'm the one that nearly killed you. Oh, my goodness. An American war veteran, he died a year ago this May, lived in Gravenhurst. Oh, my goodness. How did he find you? He met, his wife died, he was from New York, and he married a Canadian from Port Carling, and I knew her. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Unbelievable. So, in the camps when you were working, but there's another part where they were killing people in the gas chambers. Not not at this camp. Not where you were. Oh no. But you see you saw many people murdered, lying in different places all over. I did not witness okay. any. Not Thank that goodness. I worked. Yes. And then towards towards October nineteen forty four as we marched back to the camp, there was no more camp. No. That day, the Allies had thrown small little bombs called phosphorus bombs. They don't make a hole in the ground. As they fall, they ignite, light up, spread like wildfire. All the buildings were made out of wood. Mm -hmm. By the time we got there, smoke and rubbish. And you know where we ended up to live for the winter? Where? in a hole in the ground. Oh, my goodness. In the winter? Well, this was the third week of October. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. The winter was ahead of us. So where was that hole? The kitchen had a cement floor. Mm -hmm. From underneath it, at some point, dirt was taken out. It looked to us like an old-fashioned root cellar. No windows, no light, straw. Hmm. And we had to sleep on the straw like pigs. Lie, body lice. Hmm. I knew of head lice, but body lice, then I found out I carriers of various disease. Oh. Snow on the ground now. Nobody went outside at night because these guys were raping these young women. Mm -hmm. So the straw was used as a toilet. Those were the conditions in that hall. Mm -hmm. No water, 
no toilet paper, and that's where we sleep, and that's where the toilet is. I don't know how anyone would survive that. Some of them ended up with tuberculosis mm -hmm. that I knew. Yes, yeah. January, there's snow on the ground. We're marching to work. They stripped us in Auschwitz. We had no socks, we had no underwear. We had wooden clogs. Dirty, because we had no water. And that's how we marched to work in January. In the factory, we heard rumors from some of the German civilians that they heard we will be taken away from there. Then we found out the reason why. The Russian forces were coming closer to that part of Germany. They did occupy that. I knew that after. They didn't want us to be free. So they took us away in the middle of February, approximately middle of February, to Bergen-Belsen, the final journey. Right. And that's where they just, that, that, that camp was built to hold 5,000 soldiers. Mm -hmm. And they put in, the 104,000 died in Bergen-Belsen. 104,000. 104,000. Starvation, dehydration, and disease. Mm -hmm. and that, that, there was no sawdust bread to eat, nothing. Nothing. Just that dirty water soup. Now, about six days before the Allies came in, they took, orders were given, zero supply. <laughs> Because they knew, we could see at night, they are still at the fighting from a distance. Mm -hmm. So we knew they were not far away. So they didn't want us to live, they wanted to speed up our death. Right. So they took everything away. There wasn't much there anyway. And um, the miracle happened April 15, 1945, 11 o'clock in the morning. The main forces were the British, some Canadians that were in Holland already, because Bergen-Belsen was the border of the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't difficult for them to come over. Two months in the hospital with typhoid fever. Mm -hmm. The Red Cross arrived to give us some advice, from Sweden that is. Right. Uh, you have a choice. You can go back to the country where you were born. I didn't want to go there. No. And the reason for that was, it's not because all Hungarians were bad people, but they were, they were allies with the Nazi regime. Hmm. We knew that. Right. Because there was no war between Hungary and Germany. They mm -hmm. just walked in overnight, mm -hmm. silently. Yes. So you chose not to go back. You no. chose to go to... No. no. Oh, they also gave us a chance if we can go to Switzerland mm -hmm. or Sweden. Mm -hmm. And I made a choice for my sisters when I went to Sweden. Yes. And that was a blessing. Yes, it was. There, I regained faith in humanity. Yes. You were reborn April 15th. Yeah. And you ended up in Sweden. Uh, you know what it was like? Hmm. You get out of hell and into heaven. Yeah. Oh. I mean, hell is an understatement for what you survived, but in Sweden, something also wonderful happened. Yeah, because also because the way the Swedish people treated us yes. is they weren't concerned about the religion or color or right. culture. They treated us as their brothers and sisters of the same family. Yes. And when I speak in school to this generation, I said, religion, color, or culture should not make a difference in anybody's life. No. It's only your attitude that counts. Don't be concerned about six different races. Mm -hmm. The only one race we need to be concerned about 
is the human race, That's right. one race. We're all a part of one race. We one are. universe. That's right. And if you can have that message after everything that you've been through, then the rest of us can certainly adapt that attitude, Eva, don't you think? It's a choice. It is it? a choice. It because, is a choice. Yes, because even after you lived that horror, it was, it was, it was a nightmare. You had some wonderful times of your life, as in Sweden, you met the yeah. love of your life. <coughs> in uh, October 1945, there was a, this village, First of all, we were in, when we arrived in Sweden, they put us in a quarantine for three weeks to see if we are free of typhoid. Yes. And then they put us in a resort. Nice. Wonderful. Right. Mm -hmm. September came, the resort closes. Okay. So you, now you're well, you go wherever your journey will take you. Mm -hmm. Then not too far from there was a village a porcelain factory, Gustafsburg. I went there to work with maybe a dozen other mm -hmm. refugee girls. Mm -hmm. And one of 2,000 population, about a half an hour from Stockholm. And one of the girls, they were modern. Come on, we're going to a dance. I yes. said, no way, I'm not <laughs> going. I've never danced with a boy ever, ever. At a wedding, you dance with another girl. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I allowed them to talk me into it. Mm -hmm. I allowed them. So went, and those days, the boys are in one end, the girls another end. And this young Swede came over and asked me to dance. And I was shaking like a fish. <laughs> I got over it, though. Yes. And then I noticed the coat room was over there. And a beautiful Swedish girl came in. She just about to take her coat off. It was in October. And Rudy went and said something to her, and she left. Mm -hmm. Then I found out that she became the ex-girlfriend. Oh. So Rudy had his eye on somebody else. <laughs> and it was you. Yeah. So I shared this story. Uh, because a picture of our wedding picture is on the PowerPoint on the slides that I'm showing. Yes. That we were very different. Mm -hmm. A, religion. Mm -hmm. He was Protestant. Mm -hmm. He was going to school to become an engineer. I'm 21 that month. I've never entered inside a classroom. I make up for it now, though. You certainly have. You certainly have. But the message here is this, the moral of that young Swede, he didn't lock me out because I was different. Yes. He used to say to me, it's okay to be different. Yes. What's not okay is when we are indifferent. Yes. And he taught you so much. He taught you and he loved you. Unconditional Unconditionally. Acceptance yes. And Unconditional love. acceptance. Unconditional. I mean, he could have the girl I saw. When I finally went to his home at one time, my mother in law that she became, on her bureau, she had a beautiful five by seven photo of that girl. Oh so dear. had dated her for a long well, time. Well, but you but were meant to be instant instant you were soulmates that's yeah and so yes it's an, a beautiful story because he loved you unconditionally you married he taught, me how to live. He taught you how to live and yeah. you so deserved that beautiful yeah. love <laughs> yeah and i wish that your story that you had grown old together and it was a wonderful story you did have your son yes Jan. yes um, unfortunately yes <clears throat> When my, our son was 10, well, we lived in Richmond Hill, and Rudy was 35 at that time. A Major Mackenzie, somebody was drinking and driving and hit him. Yes. Two and a half years later, he passed away from the injury. <sighs> that is just so yeah, heartbreaking. I could have died with him. Yes. 
And when he was in the hospital in, in Richmond Hill at one time, and his partner at work, a British engineer, mm -hmm. and his wife, we went to visit Rudy. And I don't know, we walk on our Major Mackenzie, and the hospital in the room facing the road, and Joan said something, and I was laughing, and she said, Eva, how can you laugh when Rudy is so sick? <laughs> and I said to her, Joan, I have a 10-year-old son to raise, and if yeah. I can't laugh, I'm not good for him. Right. I have a choice. You have a choice. Yeah. And that's what you share, your message. You have a choice. You have a choice. Because you also... You have a 10-year-old son, but also when he was born, there was another sadness, loss, that, yes. a loss. I was carrying twins. Yes. And six hours before our son was born, she had died six hours before. So, Eva, from being raised in a fundamentalist home and be not... not fitting in and having a lot of obviously stress in your life because of that to surviving 11 months in a concentration camp and almost dying of starvation and disease you married the love of your life I did. you had your son and realized he had a twin sister who died before birth and then your husband, you, your life carried on. Ten years later. Ten years later. If you were a person who did not choose to be a light in this world, no one would blame you, but you are choosing to be a voice for acceptance and tolerance and love and gratitude. And because it's I needed to focus on the one that I had left. Yes. The one blessing that I had left. Yes. I needed to focus on that. I can't focus on what I have lost. Well, I mean, that is incredible. And you and your son, it has not been an easy journey as well. And I love that you wrote, you wrote this book together every step of the way. Right. And the audio book that I listened to, and I told you before, I cried quite a bit through it. But it was such an honest journey of love end of struggle yeah it was not an easy journey no it wasn't it was not an easy journey it was difficult but you can imagine a child born in this country where we are they are all education education and it yes. should be and there you have a mom that doesn't know how to read or write yes so i couldn't help him with his school book. no but what he says my mom couldn't help me with my schoolwork, but she gave me something a teacher can't. Oh. That unconditional acceptance. Unconditional acceptance. And this is, I think that everyone should read this book, all of your books actually, but this one, because you also, you wrote life lessons from every step of the way. And there's just so many and the greatest one is it takes courage to look beyond the disappointments and painful experiences from our past and not let them control our future in order for us to reach our destiny. I mean, if you can live your life by this, Eva, I think the rest of us I can't certainly can't control my life because then I'm with one foot backwards. That's right. I can't. And you are sharing your message and you are 23 years of speaking and Eva's still willing to speak, by the way, oh, yeah. <laughs> Eva Olson .ca, your website and you're sharing this information well, and your story. Here. October, I'm going to um, Ottawa again. Yes. I was there in April. And the 3rd of November, flying out to Edmonton, and from Edmonton to Calgary, from Calgary to Lethbridge, and back. And you're 94 years young. As that, yeah, I'll be 95 then. Yes. <laughs> because my birthday is in October. Okay, note to myself. Yeah, yes. so 
I, um, yeah, I go by the calling gates. Well, I, I, I meant it and I said it in our previous show that you are the most inspirational person I've ever met. It makes me cry because you're just so, you're just such a lovely person and, and I'm glad we're friends now. Yeah, you're stuck with me, just so you know. Right. <laughs> We're thank friends, you. yes. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> and I just wanted to say thank you from the bottom of my heart for everything that you do, for being a light in the world. I believe everyone should go to your website, evaolson.ca, call you to speak, to read your book, listen to your CDs. Well, thank you. And I just wanted to give you oh. a little something. <laughs> and I know oh, you know why there are those flowers. Anyways, you know what my wedding yes uh, i do i heard that in the audio book yeah and that yellow rose is for your daughter <laughs> thank you so very much thank you so you know very what? much it it's not a one-way street it, yes i do give but you i also give. receive a lot well you have listening to your story meeting you has deeply affected and changed my life and I want to we're going to have a big hug after and um, I want to share your story your message and I promise you that the life lessons that you're sharing will always be a part of my message well, thank you very much and I really to me it means a great deal I have been interviewed many many times but it's sort of a distance away, and I appreciate our close, our nearness. Yes, we are close. Yeah, we I are really close. Do. I mean it because it means a great deal to me. It and, means, uh, a d oh, yeah, and I have to say one more thing because this is the right thing to say. I went to order those flowers from April at, at April's Flowers, and when I heard, and when she heard your story and who I was getting the flowers for, she said no charge this is my gift to her so <laughs> that's the end of our show so oh, thank you so God. much eva i just thank love you, you. Thank, you. thank you thank you so this has been real life talks a show about learning how to dress up for yourself and others be empowered and resilient have hard conversations and sometimes some tears <laughs> so if you want to be empowered and resilient my call to action as always plan your life plan your death and then just love your life to death and always. <laughs> Where is it, Eva? <laughs> always. Bring your own tambourine to the party. <laughs> Thanks. I couldn't find my...